Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Boulder on this glorious November Sunday. Here in Boulder, there's snow in the weather forecast, but to me, it feels like there are warmer and brighter days ahead. My name is Jennifer Skinjaleski, and I will be the worship leader for today's service. We welcome all at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Boulder. If you are a new visitor, please email our office manager, Amy Zen, and let us know how you found us. You will find her email in the Zoom chat. Our church website has a great deal of information about the church and our activities. You will find that website in the Zoom chat as well. With us today as our guest speaker is Gil Guerrero. Gil is a volunteer with the UUA's Office of Transitions. He was a past congregational administrator for the Horizon UU Church in Carrollton, Texas, and previously on the Board of Trustees for the UU Christian Fellowship. He had a first career in the theme park industry. In his second career, he is a licensed master social worker who spent many years working in intimate partner violence and is now a staff psychotherapist for an agency in Dallas, Texas. We're happy to have you here today, Gil. Now, please ensure your microphones remain muted and join us for worship. I'm so very happy to be here with you today. It's, it's my honor to do this work. It's my privilege to do this work. Uh, last weekend, I shared with many of you a workshop called Beyond Categorical Thinking. And today I'm going to share some thoughts on my experience of identity. Fellow travelers, seekers, sisters, and brothers, we come from all the places of our separate lives to this hour from love and grief, hope and worry, from solitude and activity. We come to seek renewal and find celebration, lifting the cloud of daily concerns, pleasures and pains, we pause to give thanks, to feel wonder and to experience the privilege of this life. We have been apart let us renew our covenant together and live our beloved community by joining our voices. Come, let us worship together. Kindness. 
If you have a personal chalice or candle near your computer, please get ready to light it. We invite you to type into the chat box where your chalice is lit, the street or neighborhood, or what city if you're joining us from outside Boulder County. Now I'd like to introduce our chalice lighter, Carrie Wingert. Good morning, uh, my UU family. My name is Carrie Wingert and I'm honored to be your chalice lighter this morning. I live in Northeast Boulder uh, with my spouse, Seth, and two-year-old Marie, who you will probably hear uh, as I give my chalice lighting. Um, today, the chalice that I'm lighting is a Bolslavich chalice from my great aunt Violet, um, representing my Polish heritage and uh, reminds me that I come from a family of immigrants. Two UU services have had really lasting meaning in my life. The first uh, was when I married my spouse Seth in the little white First Unitarian Universalist Church of Omaha Sanctuary in 2012. The second uh, that I carry with me in my heart is uh, Sunday, November 13th, 2016, four years ago. Uh, Donald Trump had lost the popular vote five days before and well, you know the rest. Our little white church in Omaha was packed that Sunday we were elbow to elbow and there was standing room only in the back. We were together. We were worried for women, for our children, for our waters and lands, for those impacted by poverty, climate change, war, and vast economic inequality. We were all sick with dread together. During that service, uh, Dave Rosser of Omaha sang Simon and Garfunkel's The Sounds of Silence. He sang, and in the naked light, I saw 10,000 people, maybe more, people talking without speaking, people hearing without listening, people writing songs that voices never shared. No one dared disturb the sound of silence. Together that day, we felt responsible. During that service, we took on a responsibility together of the work to listen. We had felt we'd been the 10,000. We felt as though we had heard but not listened to our neighbor, that we talked without speaking. And as a UU with you here in Boulder, I've had the chance these past four years to try better, to bear deeper commitment, to hold on to love and to live my faith. I've been told that as a UU, protest is our prayer, voting is our sacrament, and gosh, an election time may just well be our high holy days. It is a deep privilege to be a member in this community. I light my beautiful ancestors chalice in gratitude for a community where we dare disturb the sounds of silence together. We now invite all those gathered in your various locations to join together in fellowship and community as we all say aloud our congregation's covenant. The words are in your online order of service and on the screen. We gather in fellowship, fellowship. to speak truth to, speak to, to each, each other, each other to in touch one another, touch one another to care with each other, care with each other and to seek the truth. Care with each other so and seek the truth. The truth. The truth. The truth. So be it. Well, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you today. It's a joy to be with you today as we gather together in fellowship to welcome and celebrate the heart and soul of this congregation and this country. On this roller coaster of 2020, we are showing up for each other, to care for each other, and holding each other with love through all the ups and downs and all that life brings. So now, if you have something on your heart, and I suspect many of you do, I invite you to share a few words in the chat box 
And if you feel like it, you can just share a word, blessing, joy, concern, or sorrow, whatever you would like. I will do my best to lift up a few of the comments as they go by. As you are starting to post, I see elation and hope for the election, I presume, for the return of moral and ethics and democracy to our country. Profound joy and relief. Yes, relief. Thank you. Yesterday was a day of sheer joy for me. Absolutely. It's a beautiful day. I feel I can breathe again. So much joy. Feels like an evil spell has been lifted. Indeed. Grateful for the large turnout of voters. Blessing to witness joy yesterday. Eleanor, grateful, grateful for her craft project. Wonderful. We are so blessed. We're bubbling with relief. Nice. We are saved for now, but there's much work of love to be done. Indeed. Joyful that my grandson-in-law has a new job with the U.S. Depart Justice Department. How great. Concern for my mother's health. Grateful next steps for the nation. Indeed, Amy, we hold your mother and her health in our hearts and with love. And may we also remember the increase in COVID and the deaths that are happening and that have happened for all who have lost loved ones. Concern that my son has just left on deployment. Laurel, may we hold him in our hearts and you as well. Jubilant. Having just meditated, my heart is full with love. Thank you, Peter. So wonderful. I invite you to continue posting in the chat as long as you would like, for we are all in this together and holding each other. May this sharing what's on your heart lessen the weight of the concerns that you are carrying and amplify the impact of the blessings to all. May it be so. Amen. So I have two readings that I would like to share with you. Share with you this morning and I will get my screen back up here. The first reading is from um, a book called The Teachings of Don Juan, A Yaqui Way of Knowledge by Carlos Castaneda. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with this work, Carlos Castaneda was an anthropology student at UCLA who met a Yaqui shaman from Sonora, Mexico. Uh, his name was Don Juan Matus, who ultimately became his mentor in learning Yaqui shamanism. And so this is a dialogue between uh, Carlos, who's a student, and Juan, who's his mentor. And this language is very male-centric, but uh, I think it's universal language, and I, I don't I try not to uh, to mess with people's uh, 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 words as they were written. So we'll, we'll take them in that spirit and make our own translations to the universal scale. So Carlos asks, what is a man of knowledge? A man of knowledge is one who has followed truthfully the hardships of learning. A man who has, without rushing or without faltering, gone as far as he can in unraveling the secrets of power and knowledge. Can anyone be a man of knowledge? No, not anyone. Then what must a man do to become a man of knowledge? He must challenge and defeat his four natural enemies. Anyone can try to become a man of knowledge. Very few men actually succeed, but that is only natural. The enemies a man encounters on the path to learning to become a man of knowledge are truly formidable. Most men succumb to them. When a man starts to learn, he is never clear about his objectives. His purpose is faulty. His intent is vague. He hopes for rewards that will never materialize for he knows nothing of the hardships a 
of learning. He slowly begins to learn bit by bit at first, then in big chunks, and his thoughts soon clash. What he learns is never what he pictured or imagined. And so he begins to be afraid. Learning is never what one expects. Every step of learning is a new task. And the fear the man is experiencing begins to mount mercilessly, unyieldingly. His purpose becomes a battlefield. And thus he has stumbled upon the first of his natural enemies, fear, a terrible enemy, treacherous and difficult to overcome. It remains concealed at every turn, prowling, waiting. And if the man terrified in its presence runs away, his enemy will have put an end to his quest. What will happen to the man if he runs away in fear? Nothing happens to him except that he will never learn. He will never become a man of knowledge. And what can he do to overcome fear? The answer is very simple. He must not run away. He must defy his fear. And in spite of it, he must take the next step in learning and the next and the next. He must be fully afraid and yet he must not stop. And a moment will come when his first enemy retreats. Once a man has vanquished fear, he is free from it for the rest of his life because he has acquired clarity, a clarity of mind which erases fear. He can anticipate the new steps of learning and a sharp clarity surrounds everything. The man feels that nothing is concealed. And thus he has encountered his second enemy, clarity. That clarity of mind, which is so hard to obtain, dispels fear, but it also blinds. It forces the man never to doubt himself. It gives him the assurance he can do anything that he pleases, for he sees clearly into everything. And he is courageous because he is clear, and he stops at nothing because he is clear. But all that is a mistake. It is like something incomplete. If the man yields to this make-believe power, he has succumbed to his second enemy and will be patient when he should rush. And he will fumble with learning until he winds up incapable of learning anything more. His second enemy has just stopped him cold from trying to become a man of knowledge. Instead, the man may turn into a buoyant warrior or a clown. He will be clear as long as he lives, but he will no longer learn or yearn for anything. But what does he have to do to avoid being defeated? He must do what he did with fear. He must defy his clarity and use it only to see and wait patiently and measure carefully before taking new steps. He must think above all that his clarity is almost a mistake. And a moment will come when he will understand that his clarity was only a point before his eyes. And thus he will have overcome his second enemy and will arrive at a position where nothing can harm him anymore. This will not be a mistake. It will not be only a point before his eyes. It will be true power. He will know at this point that the power he has been pursuing for so long is finally his. His ally is at his command. But he has also come across his third enemy, power. Power is the strongest of all enemies. And naturally, the easiest thing to do is to give in. After all, the man is truly invincible. He commands because he is a master. A man at this stage hardly notices his third enemy is closing in on him. And suddenly, without knowing, he will certainly have lost the battle. His enemy will have turned him into a cruel, capricious man. A man who is defeated by power dies without really knowing how to handle it. Power is only a burden upon his fate. Such a man has no command over himself and cannot tell when or how to use his power. How can he defeat his third enemy, Don Juan? He has to defy it deliberately. 
he has to come to realize the power he has seemingly conquered is in reality never his. If he conceive that clarity and power without his control over himself are worse than mistakes, he will reach a point where everything is held in check. He will know then when and how to use his power, and thus he will have defeated his third enemy. The man will be by then at the end of his journey of learning and almost without warning, he will come upon the last of his enemies, old age. This enemy is the cruelest of all, the one he won't be able to defeat completely, but only fight away. This is the time when a man has no more fears, no more impatient clarity of mind, but also the time when he has an unyielding desire to rest. If he gives in totally to his desire to lie down and forget, if he soothes himself in tiredness, he will have lost this last round. But if the man sloughs off his tiredness and lives his fate through, he can be called a man of knowledge. If only for the brief moment when he succeeds in fighting off his last invincible enemy. That moment of clarity, power, and knowledge is enough. The second reading is from the play Cyrano de Bergerac by Edmund Rostand. And this brief little snippet is Cyrano describing the fair Roxanne. She is a danger mortal, all unsuspicious, full of charms unconscious, like a sweet perfumed rose, a snare of nature, within whose petals Cupid lurks in ambush. He who has seen her smile has known perfection, instilling into trifles Grace's essence. Divinity in every careless gesture, not Venus self can mount her conch blown seaward as she can step into her chaise a porteur, nor Diane fleet across the wood springs flowered light as my lady or the stones of Paris. Thank you.
Gil, you need to unmute, please. The, the question is always the same, though it has many variants. Gil, are you Italian? No, I'm not Italian, I'm American. I had the privilege of seeing the actor and activist Edward James Olmos speak once during the period of time that I lived in Los Angeles and soon after the Rodney King riots. He said he was often criticized by some members of the Latino community for not speaking up exclusively or vocally enough about his Mexican heritage, to which he said he usually replied that Mexican was pretty far down his identity list. First and foremost, he offered that he was a human, second, a North American, third, a United States of American, and then perhaps fourth, a Mexican American. But truthfully, even that is not a fine enough sieve to tell us very much about him. Since we only have a few hours to know each other, in that spirit, I offer the following quick list of identities. I am a human. I am a male. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I used to be a Roman Catholic, capital R, capital C. I'm now just a Catholic, little c. I'm a Christian. I'm left-handed. I'm an only child. I'm North American. I'm Mexican American. I'm Texan. I'm a product of prep school. I'm a product of art school. I'm a social worker. I'm a Unitarian that loves the poetry of the Trinity. I'm universalist. Now we have all of those terrific categories to slot me into, but they still don't tell you much about who I am. Although no doubt the wheels are turning. The question is always the same, though it has many variants. Gil, are you Spanish? No, I'm not Spanish, I'm from Texas. You don't sound like you're from Texas. What can I say? I went to prep school. I'm originally from San Antonio, Texas, where more than 60% of the population identify as Latino Hispanic. San Antonio, like many towns, has had its share of tensions around the ethnic composition of her inhabitants. I always noted our particular version of detente the most in our famous annual fiesta celebration, a couple of weeks of parties and street festivals and parades started in 1891 as a celebration of the heroes of the Alamo and the Battle of San Jacinto. Some fine society ladies decorated their coaches and proceeded to parade around downtown San Antonio, pelting each other with flowers. The Battle of Flowers is now billed as the second largest parade in the country just behind the Tournament of Roses. And if you're going to have parades, you have to have pretty ladies. And San Antonio society was happy to provide lots of debutantes and dashing young men to escort them. And the king of the event, King Antonio. And a funny thing for a town that has 60% Hispanic population, that king and his court were all pretty, shall we say, pigmentation impaired. Sometimes down here in Texas, we call them gabacho in our parts. After 55 years of being on the outside looking in, the Mexicanos decided that maybe there ought to be a Mexicano king too. Our little scamps in the Mexican community named their king El Rey Feo, the ugly king. They took their cue from a medieval Spanish tale of peasant unrest who crowned their own ironic people's king the ugly one, in contrast to the handsome pale one. And a short 33 years later, the fine ladies and gentlemen who run Fiesta decided, hey, that Ray Fail bunch is pretty fun. Maybe they should be an official part of the Fiesta family events. He even got his own parade. Can anyone say separate but equal? I've always been a little proud that the guy who gets elected the Ray Fail is the one who raises the most money over $150,000 for low-income scholarships to serve San Antonio youth. I don't know how they select King Antonio and apparently their webmaster doesn't either since I couldn't find it on their website. It's kind of funny 
during my time of watching the Reifeo go by, I've seen one or two Anglo ugly kings, but when King Antonio comes by, I haven't seen any brown faces. Not so much, as they say. I've had a very blessed and privileged life. I went to the finest private prep school in San Antonio. My father was a civil servant with the Air Force for 37 years, and our family has always had strong belief in the power of education. His parents emigrated from Mexico in the teens of the 20th century. My granddad was a cowhand who worked in the cattle ranches in South Texas. My blonde haired and blue eyed mother who is adopted is probably the product of German or South Texas Czech stock. I also say that I'm blessed because until a few years ago, I only knew of one overtly racist event in my life. Ah, the beautiful Roxanne. Cyrano was right in describing her charms. Roxanne was a glorious long stemmed South Texas beauty with a glowing friendly smile and gorgeous blue eyes. And I was a shy, sheltered, prep schooled, half breed Mexican kid trying to get a little experience in the world. And I had landed first as an orderly and then as a ward clerk in a large regional, regional hospital. Roxanne and I were friendly and being roughly the same age and hormonal maturity, I began to try to get her to go out with me. It seemed like the usual mating ritual of homo sapiens sapiens, some coy denials, unavailable, but they felt to a sheltered young fellow like me, like all they needed was just a bit more charm to win her affections. Until my friend Andy, an orderly waited in one night. Gil, Roxanne really doesn't want you to ask her out anymore. Really, why? Because she said she won't go out with a Mexican. I started actually started laughing, Andy was such a kidder. But I thought, well, this deserves a little follow up with the horse's mouth. So the next time I saw the fair Roxanne, I cautiously inquired. Andy told me something, but I don't think I understood. To which Roxanne replied, I thought it was clear. Uh-huh. But I really had led a very sheltered life. This was so far out of left field, it could have been from another planet. A meteor could have landed in front of me. Wow, look, a meteor. Wow, look, a racist. At, at my school, the only tension I had ever really seen was about whether someone was smarter than someone else. I couldn't even be angry about it because it was just so completely foreign to my experience of the world. And as it does, the world marched on. I have no idea what happened to Roxanne, although the tall African-American veteran LVN, who was my outspoken guardian and mom on the ward had some choice suggestions. I wish the fair Roxanne peace on her path, wherever she has landed. Perhaps I should have been angry with her, but all I really had was pity for her and the ignorance she was raised with. The question is always the same, though it has many variants. Gil, are you Dutch Indonesian? You're Dutch Indonesian, I can tell. Now, this is a particular favorite with my Scottish Irish wife who will testify that I actually received this question. I think for some people, it's just kind of a downer that you're Mexican they really will dance around the topic to save themselves that discomfort. Dutch, Indonesian? Well, okay, to be fair, that one was in an Indonesian restaurant and apparently I was wearing a Dutch Indonesian haircut at the time. Who knew there was such a thing as a Dutch Indonesian haircut? No, I'm Mexican, Mexican American to be precise tamales and menudo and a bunch of short little tias sitting around drinking coffee, Mexican-American. Oppression is a funny thing. When we think of the word, I think most of us fall victim to the idea that racism and oppression are only individual traits and failings done by bad people. We take giant leaps to hate-filled supremacists and clanners 
and the horrific events like the death of Matthew Shepard or the horrific dragging death of James Byrd in East Texas. Those are so far away from anything that we aspire to as Unitarian Universalists, we can be comfortably appalled by them from a distance. We're not like that. We completely and categorically oppose that. But like Don Juan's seeker of knowledge, though, I think we can sometimes dash ourselves on the rocks of his second enemy, clarity. The demographics are clear. We're progressive, highly educated, got it going on kinds of people. When I was a congregational administrator, I always had to smile at the look of relief on new members' faces when they had that, I didn't know there were other cool progressive people like me around moment. Depression is a funny thing. I said that I've only known about two events of personal racism that were directed at me personally, but I wonder about the ones I don't know about. And I have become much more reflective on the systemic expression of racism. Oppression seldom comes with a noose or with dogs in the night anymore or from a bus driver sending you to the back or in a hall, hospital hallway to your face. I think today much of it is very subtle, a reasonable law that somehow seems to disproportionately affect a single population. The presumption that a person with light skin or a fine vocabulary must be honest. A resume that gets shifted to the bottom of the pile, a phone call that doesn't get returned, a wink, a whisper, a nudge. As Don Juan tries to instruct poor Carlos, the false idol of clarity can close us off from learning and true knowledge. I've seen this in my own congregation and in those that I've visited. I've heard things like, you can't be Christian and be a UU. Well, most people aren't UUs because they aren't as smart as we are. We prefer a man and a woman, a couple, because that's natural. When we know that Mexicans always have big families, I'm an only child with an only child. When we know that a disabled person can't keep up with us, when we know that Christians are all fundamentalists, when we know that gay people only talk about gay stuff, when we know what is natural, clarity has defeated us. When we fall into that shorthand, when we try to paint universal truths with those dull categorical brushstrokes, we fail ourselves and we fail our faith. We fail our faith in our interdependent web of life. We fail our faith in the ongoing search for truth and meaning. We fail our faith in inherent worth and dignity. Last week, I shared time with your congregation with a workshop. And as you continue on your journey to call a minister, I remind you that those of us who conduct these workshops and share our experiences are committed to the idea that it is a vitally important ministry to help you get the absolute best match for your congregation. And we truly believe that your chances of getting the best match greatly improve by having these ongoing dialogues about this lazy shorthand, the categories that sneak into our thinking and can possibly block you from getting your best match. So I'd like to close for a moment and I'd like you to take a deep breath with me. And I'd like you to Focus your mind and share an intention into the universe with me. May we always be open to new truth. May we always seek the path of knowledge. May we always have clarity without hubris. And may we always honor and bring honor to our faith. Amen.
month, we share our offering plate with Community Food Share. Community Food Share is a food bank fighting hunger in Boulder and, Bro and Broomfield counties by providing access to fresh, nutritious food through their local partners, as well as on-site and mobile food pantries. Hunger is the reality for one in nine people in Boulder and Broomfield counties. That is 41,000 people, of which 9,000 are children. Since the pandemic hit Colorado in March, they have distributed over 1 million pounds of food each month, the highest monthly total since they opened their doors nearly four decades ago. These record-breaking numbers are evidence that more and more community members are needing help for the first time. In fact, they expect a 35% increase in demand for food from their food bank for months to come. Community Food Share accepts all sizes of food donations from a single box to a whole truckload. They also accept cash donations because they're able through their connections in the community to convert every dollar donated into three meals. Volunteering is also tremendously helpful as one hour of volunteering translates to 80 meals for community members in need. You can make a donation now using the link posted in our chat by sending a, link, a check to UUCB or by scanning the QR code on the next slide with your mobile phone. Please be as generous as you can. We will now receive the offering.
May our gifts be used to enact justice, bringing peace and love to the Boulder community. Sisters and brothers, travelers and seekers, our worship is now ended, but our service truly now begins. Hear these words of W.E.B. Du Bois that seem so appropriate today, even as they were when they were written. Now is the accepted time, not tomorrow, not some other convenient season. It is today that our best work can be done and not some future day or future year. It is today that we fit ourselves for the greater usefulness of tomorrow. Today is the seed time. Now are the hours of work and tomorrow comes the harvest and the play time. Go now in peace to be the change that we want in the world, amen. in peace wander as you may blessed is the path you take may love guide you on your way go your way in peace wander as you may wander as you blessed is the path you take may love guide you on your way We now invite you to stay with us in our Zoom rooms for a time of online fellowship and discussion.